Well, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's been a wonderful conference. And boy, the caterers, I think, could uh, get hired out by lots and lots of people. They're, they're terrific. Uh, so thanks for the great organization. Well, Ilias, I might be able to answer your question, but Thais, uh, she, she uh, sort of uh, helped me out here uh, with a bunch of definitions, because I'm also going to talk about cover free families, but I'm going to talk about uh, an application in networking, if you, if you know something about my work. Uh, and, uh, and then I'm actually going to talk about another application. And, and so uh, this is, of course, joint work with uh, Charlie Colburn, but also many other people. And um, first, I wanted to say happy birthday, Doug. Uh, <laughs> we're all on the, the ticking old meter. <laughs> uh, and so I was thinking, uh, what, what is my intersection with Doug? Well, first, we're both Canadian. Uh, we also have the fact that uh, uh, either we attended or went, uh, worked for the University of Waterloo. Um, we also share the fact that we're both computer scientists, but we also uh, both worked at the University of Manitoba. So, uh, so that's uh, at least part of our uh, intersection. I, I guess I should really add cover free families in there. <laughs> uh, so uh, some of my work relates to wireless networks. And in particular, wireless networks uh, share what's called a broadcast channel. And so just, just like here, where you know, I I'm, I'm happen to have the floor right now, uh, but I mean, there can be private conversations going on as well, because this, this space is being shared. And, and when you have a broadcast channel, uh, we need some kind of what's called a medium access control protocol. And the job of that protocol is to decide, okay, who gets to transmit next? Uh, and this is just a picture of uh, one of the wireless test beds that we use for some of our implementation work. Uh, this one happens to be at the University of Ghent in uh, Belgium. Now, when it comes to access control strategies, we have lots and lots of different techniques, but by and large, they kind of fall into two major categories. Uh, one is sometimes called a channel partitioning scheme, uh, and you have different flavors of those. So you might take the channel and partition it uh, in time. Uh, and so in each, time slot, uh, it gets assigned to a specific node who is permitted to transmit in that slot. Uh, another thing you could do is you could say, well, I have a certain uh, frequency spectrum that I'm using for my communication. How about I chop that up into subfrequencies and assign a subfrequency to each node instead? And then we can have concurrent transmissions but of course the bandwidth is smaller and so it takes longer to transmit the same amount of information. Uh, another way you can partition things up is uh, with CDMA, code division multiple access schemes, where you design a code, you assign a code to each node, and then because those code words are orthogonal to each other, uh, everyone can transmit simultaneously but to be able to decode the transmission, you need to know uh, the code word of the transmitter you're communicating with. So those are a few uh, channel partitioning schemes. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we have random access schemes. Uh, and, and these involve, uh, so they're also called contention schemes. So, so instead of sort of nicely uh, organizing things like we do in a channel partitioning schemes, you just say, well, everybody's competing for the channel. So 
let them go. <laughs> and, and so uh, the simplest form actually was a, what was called an aloha scheme. Uh, so what they wanted to do was set up a, uh, a radio network in the Hawaiian Islands instead of uh, building under, underwater cables to connect the islands. And essentially that's how that scheme worked. It was just complete random access scheme. Uh, but you're probably more familiar with Wi-Fi uh, or Ethernet. So Ethernet is really the, the cousin of Wi-Fi running across uh, um, a, a wire, a coaxial cable of some sort. Now, these schemes, there's lots and lots of trade-offs uh, because some, some of these schemes are more appropriate for different uh, types of, of uh, um, data, but generally the random access schemes are considered to be simpler uh, because you don't need to design anything in advance. You just compete in some way for the channel. Uh, but what you give up is any possibility of having a guarantee on the delay. Uh, so the delays are just probabilistic. Uh, you also give up any notion of being fair to all of those that are competing for the channel. Uh, but another advantage is uh, they're a little better in terms of adaptation. So if you have nodes or users entering this system, it's easier to accommodate. Or if you have users or nodes leaving the system, again, it can be easier to accommodate, actually uh, easier to join. Uh, the, the channel partitioning schemes also can handle nodes leaving uh, fairly straightforwardly. All right, now, uh, some of the challenges of schemes, channel partitioning schemes, uh, especially uh, if you're looking at time division schemes, especially in wireless networks, is when you have mobile nodes. Uh, that test bed uh, is pretty hilarious, I think. They, they took a, a Roomba vacuum cleaner, uh, pulled out the, the vacuum cleaner and stuck a wireless node on it. And now you can actually program different mobility models onto the node. <laughs> and so you can have these mobile nodes in with these fixed nodes in the test bed. Uh, but, but dealing with mobility is, is a challenging issue. Um, also challenging, at least for indoors, is uh, synchronization. Uh, it's, pretty straightforward to do synchronization outside because uh, we just use triangulation from the, the satellites we have uh, in orbit, uh, but localization indoors is still an unsolved problem. I mean, they're getting better, but uh, uh, it's still not as good as out, outdoors. Another thing to take into account is, is your network running in what's called infrastructure mode or ad hoc mode? Now, you're probably more familiar with infrastructure mode because I, you probably have a cell phone in your pocket uh, and it runs in infrastructure mode or probably the Wi-Fi uh, in this room, there it is, there's a base station. Um, so that's a piece of infrastructure and and essentially your communication you always have to go through uh, this centralized node into the rest of the network but there are these so-called ad hoc modes so you can put your phone into ad hoc mode if you want and now we don't have any centralized control or any fixed in infrastructure that we depend on and, and so the network in that case has to organize itself. And, and so in addition to being a, a source of data or a destination of data, now we also have to perform routing functions. And, and these uh, networks, well, they were conceived initially um, 
uh, as military networks, but, but now we have many different variants with actually slightly different architectures. Uh, so you might have heard of vehicular networks, uh, which also involves some ad hoc combined with infrastructure mode and sensor networks and, and many other varieties. Now, if you're interested in supporting voice communication, uh, then for a real time conversation, the end to end to end, to end to end delays need to be less than 150 milliseconds. They can be a little bit longer, but if it's more than 400 milliseconds, people just really get upset and find it hard to actually have a conversation with someone on the other side. Um, and so really, if, you're, if you want to support voice well, uh, you should be thinking about a scheduled uh, family of medium access control protocols. I mean, you might say, well, I just watched uh, uh, someone from China give a talk and it seems okay. Um, well, these days we actually over provision the network uh, to kind of uh, support these kind of communications, but, but uh, so anyway, that, that's why things work as well as they work uh, these days. Now, if we're one way uh, to handle uh, topology changes, so nodes moving in the network in ad hoc networks is to become aware of the topology. So the strategies are dependent on the current topology. And so some of the schemes that are used are, um, what you could do is, for example, Scott Corson and, and, and uh, his student Zhu uh, came up with this idea of, well, you could actually do some contention uh, and then follow that by some uh, slotted uh, schedule. So you can alternate between a contention based scheme and a, and a scheduled scheme. Um, another idea is to say, well, I could just build a, a straight time division multiple access scheme. And then, uh, and, and so each node would have a reserve slot. But if they didn't want to use their slot, then we could actually have a uh, contention run inside the slot. So you could try and uh, have some kind of collision resolution scheme running inside the slot itself. And actually what's kind of cool about this idea um, uh, is that you can actually get what's called spatial reuse so that, that uh, you can have multiple concurrent conversations going on if the nodes are separated by enough distance. Um, what I wanted to talk about today, though, was uh, topology transparent schemes. So, so here we're looking to design a scheduling scheme where we are not aware of who our specific neighbors are. Uh, and, and in this case, we have two design parameters. So one is n, the number the total number of nodes in the network you're trying to support, and then uh, D, the maximum node degree. And, and so finally some combinatorics. Uh, the property that we're interested in is for each node, uh, we want to guarantee that if, if a node has at most D neighbors, uh, then the schedule you assign to that node uh, will guarantee a collision-free slot to each of its neighbors. Okay, <clears throat> so the schedule then, we're just going to represent it as a, a subset on n, little n. Notice little n need not be uh, the same as the total number of nodes in the network. And we're just really gonna use, uh, uh, represented as the characteristic vector on the set 
of, uh, of the set. And one is going to denote that this, the node is allowed to transmit in that slot, whereas zero indicates that the node is not allowed to transmit. In, instead, it will be listening. So here, I'm actually looking at radios that are what are called half duplex. So you can't transmit and receive at the same time. You can either transmit or receive, and that's, that's all. There are fancier transceivers, but, but we won't get into that here. All right, so then the combinatorial problem asks and, and was very nicely introduced uh, by Tia, uh, is given, give each node VI a subset TI with the property that D or fewer other subsets uh, can't contain uh, my, my own schedule. And uh, of course, we can express this mathematically. And we saw that this was corresponds to a D cover free family. Now, uh, so, so Klimtak and Farago actually published the first uh, paper on topology transparent scheduling. But th what they didn't know was really what they were building. Uh, it turned out that uh, the known uh, topology transparent MAC protocols actually corresponded, uh, the transmission schedules corresponded to those derived from an orthogonal array. And so here's a tiny little orthogonal array, and each column or code word, we can convert that uh, at, into a schedule by taking each code word, um, each symbol and each code word, and uh, uh, assigning it uh, to a subframe. So we're going to concatenate uh, frames together to form a schedule. And we're just going to assign the uh, ith uh, slot in the subframe uh, to the symbol in the code word. And, and this tiny little orthogonal array can support up to uh, 16 nodes and uh, node degree up to uh, uh, three, which is pretty good, and and so what? So what's the topology transparent idea? So let's focus on the left side of the figure right now, uh, and let's assume that this is the current topology of the network. So I have a blue, red, green, and yellow node, and so what I've done is I've just uh, picked a random code word to assign to each node. Um, and built its corresponding schedule. And let's assume that we're synchronized on the frame boundary and each node is transmitting. And, and so what's interesting here is that we actually can have collisions. So the, the black, so at the bottom here, what I've done is I've shown uh, in black when I have a collision in other words, uh, two or more nodes are transmitting at the same time. So uh, unless you have special hardware, you usually can't decode anything from a collision. So it's just wasted. But, but what we can see is that uh, the, the red node is successful in slot one, blue in slot three. White, white just indicates the slot goes wasted. Um, and, and you can see by the end of, of the frame, each, each node has had a successful slot and all the others would be uh, receiving in that time. So I'm able to transmit to each of my neighbors successfully and, and receive from them. Now, let's suppose the blue node moved out of the a range of this red node and a purple node moved in. And now I just picked another code word and assigned it to the purple node. And you'll see, although the, the slots in which I'm successful might have changed, it's still true that each, each node is successfully able to transmit to each of its, its neighbors. Uh, and so in that sense, it's topology, it's transparent to the topology, right? We didn't have to know exactly who my neighbors were. Uh, the fact that we designed it such that the, 
the schedules came from a, an orthogonal array and have this nice cover-free property, uh, give me this guarantee. And so I know that I'll be successful uh, by the end of the frame. Pretty cool. <laughs> um, uh, we also were showed that uh, if we use the signer system, it supports the largest number of nodes for a given frame length. So here's a little S2413. Uh, this one supports uh, 13 nodes and, uh, and also uh, D, D equal to three neighbors or up to three neighbors. And so, you know, orthogonal arrays and Steiner systems are just specific types of cover-free families. Um, now, of course, uh, there's a lot of trade-offs in the design parameters um, and the impact on the delay and throughput characteristics of the schedules that, that we obtain. Uh, a lot of times, what's nice is that we're actually able to build schedules that are much shorter than the total number of nodes in, in the network. Uh, and then you might say, well, this parameter D, that's a little bit of a problem because, you know, it could be that as the nodes are moving around, you might exceed uh, that degree uh, bound. And, and certainly it shouldn't be any surprise to you that in that case, uh, you know, now we have more co contention and we're going to lose our delay guarantee and in fact the that just becomes probabilistic um, and we've done some cool extensions on topology transparent scheduling uh, it turns out that it's actually easier to uh, synchronize on slot boundaries than on frame boundaries uh, so with wensong chu using superimposed codes we were able to look at uh, uh, extensions to slot synchronization. It does make the frames much longer. Um, and and uh, with Peter Dukes, uh, we did some work on, on extending to ternary schedules because in sensor networks, what you want to do is they generally run on uh, tiny little batteries. And so what you want to do is you want to put them to sleep. Uh, but if they're asleep, they can't receive. So you have to be careful that, uh, that you're awake and in a receive state when, uh, when someone else is transmitting. And you need to make sure you can hear from each of your neighbors potentially. So, so you have to uh, look at, at that case. Uh, and that was done using decompositions of uh, directed uh, graphs. Uh, we also looked at, well, maybe it's, maybe some of the nodes in the network um, might have more data to transmit than other nodes. And so perhaps they should have more than one slot uh, in, in a frame assigned to them. So we looked at extending to variable weight sequences. Uh, and we did that with, uh, one of our graduate students, Jonathan Lutz, using transversal designs. All right, well, oh dear. Okay, so I'm gonna change gears. Well, sorta. Uh, you, can, you can see. Uh, so, so more recently, we've been working on uh, design and analysis of uh, screening experiments. So in a screening experiment, what you're interested to do is determine which are the factors impacting uh, a measured response. Now, it turns out from a networking point of view, we're also interested in interactions because interactions uh, are interesting between the protocols. And so, like Elias asked the question, well, why don't you just use a covering array? Uh, I mean, that might be the first thing you think of, right? Uh, so here's a little, a little covering array, and, and actually what I'd like to just point out is this notation row of uh, A, so A here is the covering array, or array in question, and T here is the interaction, 
And uh, so row is just which rows are, is this interaction covered in? And, and so, for example, here, the interaction when A is set to zero, B is set to zero, happens to be the first four rows. Uh, here, when B is one, it's only in row five. And, and here, uh, A is one, B is zero, is only in row six. And, and I think you know uh, how these work. Um, however, why is coverage not enough? Uh, the reason is it doesn't ensure that we can distinguish the influence of different T-way interactions. And so in particular, in this little example, uh, there are three two-way interactions, uh, A0, B1, A0, C2, C2, uh, D is one. Those all only occur in row five. And so if I was running this set of experiments, so the experiment is made up of nine tests. So I make a measurement uh, after running the uh, a test with each uh, factor set to the particular level given. Um, if something weird happened in, in row five, the test in row five, I wouldn't be able to uh, figure out which, which of those interactions was responsible for this weird measurement I saw. And, and so we could actually think of that as a collision. And, uh, and so really this idea of being able to locate in a covering array is something like the problem of uh, collisions in the scheduling. And we use the decover free family uh, to construct schedules with a guarantee that we had a collision free transmission slot. Well, now instead of our subsets corresponding to slots in a schedule, we can think of uh, the subset as corresponding to the set of rows in which an interaction uh, is covered. And, and so Charlie defined uh, a DT locating array as it's just an extension of, of a covering array with this special locating property. And, and they grow uh, they're small, so this, this is awesome. Um, and so I just wanted to show that, that now uh, in the locating array, you can see that each, each of those interactions occurs multiple times. And there's a specialization uh, uh, to, of cover free families to detecting arrays, which corresponds to um, union free families. Um, and, and so really what I, what I think is interesting here is that I have apparently two different problems. Uh, one on transparency, topology transparent scheduling, the other on design and analysis of screening experiments. And on the surface, these look like very different problems, uh, but the underlying combinatorial objects happen to be the same and they both use cover free families. And in keeping with, uh, the cool cooling code theme. Uh, hey, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs>